Dr. John Myers is Associate Professor and Program Leader in Social Science Education in the School of Teacher Education. He earned a PhD from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto in Curriculum Teaching and Learning with a specialization in International and Comparative Education. Before arriving at FSU in 2012, he was Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. So uh, thank you, Dr. John Myers for uh, joining us and uh, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Mel, appreciate that. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking a little time out of your busy day. Um, unfortunately, I can't see everybody as I talk into the, the Zoom void. So please don't hesitate to yell out or ask questions or however you need to make yourself known because I can't see you. Um, but I appreciate the time here. So um, I'll jump right in here. This study, um, this is kind of a, an initial study that I did um, some time ago, and it's kind of a new direction for me. So any feedback or comments is also appreciated. It focuses on the, the area of data visualizations in social studies education. And so that term, many of you know, but it's also um, maybe not universal. And it really, I'm using it to, ref it's really come to refer to mostly graphs and maps, but the field has exploded so much that there are so many diverse types and there are interactive types online. There's a huge range of types and forms. There's designers and artists have gotten involved in kind of data art. So it's just become this very broad term that tries to capture data encoded in graphical form. I'll talk more a little bit about that. But again, that's what I'm kind of I'm focusing on. There's a lot more research on graphs and uh, especially in STEM education. So science and math, not maybe not surprisingly, have been researching this area for a while, but it's really never caught on in social studies until more recently. And even now it's kind of a small field, despite the fact that if you look around the you in the world and especially online, um, the social sciences are pushing, there's a huge number of uh, or amount of graphs and visualizations used to deal with social science um, and current events. So kind of our forte. So to give some kind of context to the study that I did, first um, in social studies, a big area has been um, become recently is reasoning with online information, but Sam Weinberg and others refer to as civic online reasoning. This has always been an area of study in social studies, but it's especially been driven lately by um, all of our fun, kind of the fun news about public, about fake news and misinformation. So as those kind of issues have become more current and more public, they've been reflected in the research area in my field. And again, there's a major concern with those, with those more recently. So it's also positioned, this kind of notion of online reasoning is positioned as a key citizenship skill, which is um, common in my field, of course, but it's really kind of positioned as this is a new um, area for citizenship. Some people refer to it as digital citizenship. There's other terms. So it's been a concern in social studies for some time. And this is just a short um, quote from the National Council for Social Studies about the, how important it is to develop a capacity for gathering and evaluating sources and then using evidence in disciplinary ways. So again, just to kind of ground and frame the study here. I'll take a stab at a kind of problem statement for this particular study. And um, it really is related to teaching current events. Current events is one of these kind of what I call a gray area in social studies. All teachers teach them pretty much, but they're really not very formalized in the curriculum. So we know from survey research that they they typically teach them on a weekly basis, it's common. But again, there's no standard for it. There's no resources for it. The textbooks don't help because they're not up to date. And so um, what teachers do is they go online for resources and they might do that in all classes, but in social studies, it's a particularly kind of profound um, occupation for teachers is to go online and search for res resources that can help them teach and also to understand, to learn and to understand and teach about current events. And then ultimately little is known about how social studies teachers, um, how they, how social studies teachers think about data visualizations as a particular type of informational resource. There are multiple, multiple kinds, of course. Um, a lot are, the majority are written probably, but data visualizations have become more and more front and center in ways 
um, in efforts to communicate, you know, especially these massive data sets about the world. And then the research that has been done, of which there is not a lot, is mostly not been specific to particular visualization types. It's, for, it's been more general survey type research about what, what has been done or what's, in tech, or what's in textbooks. And there's a massive difference, as I'll show in the study, there's a huge difference between the kind of visualizations they use in social studies textbooks, which are basic and simple, and the ones that are online. And then the other piece that I wanna kind of frame here, if, if I ask all of you to think back to your social studies days, um, I hope it's not too bad to ask that, but if you think back, um, so there is, we, this is one of the things I teach with my teacher education students. One of the things I, I start with at the beginning is to suggest that we need to confront this kind of reputation we have in social studies as learning history, as this long list of memorizing facts and dates and mostly lower order thinking. Of course, the field's changed a lot and classroom practices changed a lot, but that's, that persists and it's still the reputation and it's still based in some truth. So how, how, how teachers think about and use kind of more innovative and cutting edge informational resources that they find online, um, I'm framing within this broader tradition of facts to memorize. So data visualizations, which is I've, I realized is say it 10 times, it gets pretty tiring as I prepare this presentation. I'll use it interchangeably with graphs, um, but again, it's just more comprehensive to use that term. But the, as, if I was to take a stab at a definition, they are, what they would generally refer to is um, algorithmically drawn um, data that communicate information by encoding data in abstract graphical forms. Uh, there's also infographics and there's other related terms people use and argue about because they're academics and that's you know what we like to do but infographics refers to anything that's hand has a hand-drawn element or an element that's based in real world that's not um, abstract and as i mentioned before i don't think i need to make a huge case you can just go on to the new york times or the washington post or really any news source this today and you will see that visualizations are front and center in political campaigns battles over public policy, um, any news media. The New York Times has devoted departments to creating online graphics that are interactive. And in fact, they're super innovative in that respect. We'll have won awards. Um, but you know, again, this is how we learn to a great extent. This is how we learn about current events today is through visual means. And this is a particular interest to me. I mentioned before that I'm shifting towards this um, it's a new area of research for me, but it's an area that I've always been interested, especially visual learning. And so um, this has kind of connected a few pieces of social studies that I'm interested in. Because you're here and you're my captive audience, I wanted to go through a few examples because I'm you know, at least trying to make myself practice what I preach and not just talk about this, but to show um, and not just tell. So we're gonna look at two examples. I'm gonna ask for some audience participation um, if I dare. And so this is just to show a couple of graphs and to kind of raise, I'll, I'm gonna use them to raise some points. There are things you've probably seen before, but just to kind of raise some points about the issues I'm getting at. So anybody wanna tell us, anyone recognize this familiar graph? Wanna say anything about it? You're gonna to have to just shout. Is it COVID um, related? Like if you're, using mask or taking a vaccine, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, it's the COVID. I didn't label it uh, obviously because that'd be too easy, but uh -huh. too simple, but right. So thanks, Sherry, That's it's about COVID. It's the flatten the curve graph that um, this is, again, that people have seen it and are familiar, not everyone uses the kind of label, but it's, it's probably, and you can thank me later, but it's probably for, it's probably the most famous graph in the world right now. And it's particularly over the last two, you know, year and a half or so, it was extremely widespread. Those of you who are on social media more than I am probably got it over and over in various versions. It, um, it's, um, so again, it's part of this campaign to get people to wear masks early on, especially before the vaccine. And it was hugely successful and went you know, wild online. But I wanna make a couple points about it. First of all, it mainstreamed data visualizations to some extent. 
So it, what it did, it was extremely successful, at least, you know, anecdotally. It uh, was very good at communicating of a difficult public health concept that if you do this, this is what can happen, right? This is what we can prevent and this is how it works. Um, and so it was very effective in that way, but it also raises a couple concerns about things. So first, most people understood it to represent actual data and it's not, it's, it's a theoretical model projecting impact. And I know that because articles have been written about the flatten the curve graph, you can search for them and find them. They're actually quite interesting. There's a history to everything apparently these days. And um, so this one was actually based on something that was done way before this. And it only really became widespread after a hypothetical dotted line was added, the healthcare system capacity. And, you know, again, you can, there's nothing wrong. Like it, it served its purpose. It was very effective. It was very powerful, but people also took it as truth, right? People took it as being some real measure to a great extent. And so, you know, it wasn't even, if you even think about it, this idea of a healthcare system capacity would vary so widely wherever you went in different towns from city to city. So it's hard to make that case. But again, I'll, I'll kind of, I wanna using this to illustrate some of the teaching challenges around these. That's one, and it got one more example to pull you back to 2016 election. Um, and anyone wanna say something about like, what's the problem with this map? This was proudly hung in the White House to show the strength of victory. Um, it's not false, but there's some major, major problems with it. And I will say that the data viz visualization community went nuts when this was used to show something about the election. Anyone wanna suggest why it's not a great map or might be misleading? Um, may I participate? I don't know if anyone can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I think that that might be misleading because when you see it in a geographic sense, it does look like Republicans hold more uh, political power in this nation, but it's misleading in the sense that this is showing, uh, what it's not showing is population density. For example, yeah. uh, just Queens has more uh, voters than five states combined of the lowest populations. So it's not showing you that population density and, and truly the skid of the population's voting. Yeah, Elias, that's great. That's a great point and very you know, accurate in what people responded to. This was, it was also then tweaked a bit to make even even stronger message, add a few words, again, not false, but it's highly misleading. And so like he said, you know, this is county level data. And so area is not the same as population, right? Land area. So, um, and he stole my example actually of comparing like New York County in New York to, you know, a rural county or something. Now, we all know that intuitively, but think how powerful this message was and how many people looked at this because they see a map, maps don't lie, and it's not a lie, but the message is there, right? And so this is how data viz kind of experts responded. And this is what it looks like if you scale it, if you scale the, the form, the symbols to population. The problem here, of course, is that it's not that easy. Like if you don't know the election results, it's not that easy to tell who won, right? What are you going to do? Count the dots or something, or measure? Start measuring them. So it gives you a more kind of immediate reaction that's more balanced and accurate, but it also is not very precise. And the point here is that, again, the whole point of both of these is that neither was wrong, but both are used one, um, you know, for a very good purpose, but to highlight they highlight the authority that visualizations have. That when people and there's been a number of studies on this where people see graphs and they believe it because it's true, right? It's, it's information, it's numbers, it's data. Um, and also, but they also show the potential to mislead and even lie. It's really not that hard to do. And so I'm pulling this back as these are just examples of some of the things I was thinking about and framing the study by. And so this is one of the main challenges I think is for, you know, I wanted to know how, to what extent do teachers really understand that there's this kind of aura of authority scientific objectivity um, that data visions are seen as neutral, unfiltered information. What one scholar, Helen Kennedy, who's in um, media studies calls, I love this phrase, windows onto data. So the idea is that people look at a graph, right? Any kind of graph, and especially a really complicated one, a large data set, and they feel like you're looking through a window to see this pure, unfiltered, 
untainted data. And you're not, right? Because the what scholars will argue that really focus on this issue is that they um, should be understood as authored texts that privilege certain views. And they should do that because they are, as Helen Kennedy describes, who she writes very well on this, there are abstractions and reductions of the world, the result of human choices, social conventions about graphs, about how um, meaningful they are, technological processes and affordances, et cetera. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. But so this is again, kind of some of the background and framing and kind of framework that I'm using to think through how teachers might approach data visualizations. Okay, so that little detour into examples is accomplished. This study, um, what I did for this study, I'll get more specific here. The aim is to explore how teachers understand data visualizations as sources of information for teaching. Again, we know they use them. We don't know how they think about them or so much about how they use them or even how, what, how, they, how they think of them again as kind of um, the nature of information. And so what I have had teachers do is they looked at visualizations from two sources, textbook and online news media. And I'll show you the, the graphs I chose and which pre present of course diverse types, but also massively different degrees of complexity. And they represent what teachers will see both um, in their textbook, which they probably ignore and don't use very much. And then what they use when they go online and seek out resources for, for their classes. And what I did was it's qualitative task-based interview design. Some people refer to this as elicitation activities or tasks. If you know photo elicitation, if you've heard of that, that's a very popular, it's the same idea here. And really what it is, it's trying to use manipulative objects they can manipulate to generate um, participants thinking and voice for ideas that might otherwise be unspoken, might be their part of their experience, but more implicit um, ideas. And so this is uh, with 25 secondary teachers across five schools, middle and high school social studies teachers. And so what I asked them to do, I of course asked broader questions too, but the, the core of it was really asking them to rank sets of printed um, graphs according to their value for teaching. And that was what I emphasized and focused, how they think about them in terms of the value for teaching for them. And the ranking, ranking and ordering is a particular kind of activity. There's lots of ways, activities you can do for elicitation interviews but um, these are useful for determining the features that people consider central to particular practices. So these are the visualizations from a textbook I chose. It's a US government textbook. And they're not surprising. They're fairly straightforward. Um, I chose different types. You'll see a pie graph, bar chart, you know, through a table end. The, the top center one is infographics. Um, to add more kind of diversity there. But then the ones that are more interesting perhaps are the ones from online news media. Um, and I present these. And again, the focus was not on the content because really, literally it was impossible for me to find graphs that were all the, the diversity that I wanted. And the diversity, I can talk about it later, but it's, it's based on a framework of the kind of categories of visualizations. There are a huge number of them, including some very unique forms. But what I tried to do was just select from these different categories and ones. But again, the focus is not on the content. That was a limitation of the study, but it was one I realized I couldn't avoid. And so some of these you might recognize and some of them you may not. But I'm gonna jump right into the, the findings with these and some of these will come back later. Um, but for these, I did descriptive stats and I didn't really, it's not really the focus of the study. It's really the qualitative data that I thought was most interesting. And um, so I'm gonna jump kind of into that. First I'll show, I also did, I did um, these arrays of the ways that the rankings were distributed for graphs. I did it for both sets. And so this kind of, this is kind of an initial way to explore the data. It wasn't again, the central piece of it, but it was you know referenced when I wrote it up. And it, it helps you see where, of course, it helps you see which ones were liked or not, but it also sees the distribution is nice because it helps you see directly with each other. Like for example, some are very polarizing. So if you look at the bottom center, the network diagram, 
which is the one that looks like spider webs over there, or, or one teacher called it a pin cushion. That was, you know, there was, it was mostly liked, but it also was a bit polarized. You had some strong opinions about it. And you'll see other ones that were either widely unpopular, like the scatter plot in the top left, or other ones that were more popular. But the main findings here were from qualitative analysis of the interviews, because the rankings were really not only about the rankings, they were about how teachers explain their rankings. That was kind of the point of them. And so they, this finally, maybe some sense can be made about my title. It's on the two main categories of how they talked about using data visualizations for teaching and the value of them. One, they valued truth and the other group valued beauty. Truth was the primary major um, theme with, with more teachers involved, but there was also a subset who valued this notion of beauty, which I'll kind of explain a bit. And I'll also mention that, it, you know, this is, um, it wasn't clear cut. It wasn't like two actual groups. Some teachers actually held both beliefs at certain times and for certain ways. So they could kind of hold on to both of those. Um, but this is kind of a little bit of a comparison of the major findings, um, the themes. So for truth, for the truthful group, the kind of subheaded it with, you know, one of the quotes from the interviews, the answers are right in front of you, kind of summed up their thinking about this. And then they focused on two categories, which is visual simplicity. This is what they looked for and thought was valuable in graphs and visualizations, and also familiar visual, visualizations. They wanted simple, familiar. The ones who were interested in what I'm calling beautiful data, which draws on the literature, it's not just my exaggerated term, and the kind of sub, sub, um, kind of the quote for that subheading is more like a picture. They described it, which I thought captured it well, but they were interested actually in visual complexity as a teaching tool in contrast to the other group. And they were especially drawn to striking visualizations Although I should say, comes out better in my paper than it will here, there were limitations. And of course, there were contradictions on all side, on, in all of these categories. They were not as neat and clean as I'm presenting it. So for the truthful group, answers right in front of you. So they looked at visual simplicity to transmit information. They ranked according to the efficiency of graphs, in their view, at providing objective, accurate information that students can instantly process. So they, they described the graphs they like as super quick and easy, giveaways, get to the point, answers right in front of you, to understand it, look at it, and see it within the first five seconds. And then my favorite one is the least amount of effort necessary to acquire the information. And again, the, the bottom quote, which I'll say in a second, frames this. like I, It's not really a criticism of teachers because I understand the pressures social studies teachers have we deal a lot with coverage. How can you get through the curriculum? And like I, um, we joke in social studies that if you teach American history and you can get to the 1970s by the end of the year, you're probably the teacher of the year because it's so difficult to do that. And it's really this massive rush to cover and get through the curriculum. So this idea that it's the least amount of effort to acquire the information, but it also reflects a long held tradition in social studies of the lecture and facts and memorizing dates. So um, another person said, as it terrible as it sounds, we don't have enough time to really break down everything to understand it. In class, I need something where I can show them it and it can convey that information quickly. Whereas I would probably have to explain that graph and point it to the network graph for 10 minutes. And the kind of exemplars, the ones that exemplified this category were the pie chart, maybe not surprisingly, because it's simple, fast, the bar chart and the map. And even though it's kind of a quirky, unusual map, they still maps feel good to us. We like it, it's a recognizable form. Um, but they favored the most familiar types that students would recognize from textbooks, which they described as classic and normal. Loaded term, obviously, this idea of what's normal in graphs and what's not. Um, so some said that the bar chart is a safe bet, that it's just easy to read. There are two colors and you can see it very, very just black and white. Ironically, it's not black and white, it's blue and orange, but we get the point. Pie chart as old faithful, 
great characterization. And I can tell you right now, anything pie chart, they eat it up. And so, like I said, these are the ones that they focused on truthful information. And you can see it aligns with some of the kind of broader trends in social studies education. And to kind of recap what they, you know, they focused on transmitting information. They didn't question the information. It's information is right, information is good. We just wanna get it into those kids' heads as fast as we can. They avoided teaching students to read visualizations. Like they didn't wanna spend time for that. And I always feel I understand that, but that's also a concern. And then the notion that visual complexity is an obstacle to learning. And I'll contrast that. So the second main theme was this notion of beautiful information, beautiful data, um, more like a picture. And so for this group, which was a smaller group, um, visual complexity was used to explore information. They liked the idea of this some more complex graphs. There's limits on this, and I'll go into it as well here as I would in the paper, but it's there are limits on how complex that works. But they ranked according to the aesthetic qualities of the visualizations, you know, and the, the, the capacity for aesthetics to engage students. So that's what we're always trying to do with kids is engage them. I think we've all felt like that. The wheels turning in their head, get the wheels turning in their head. Um, much more dramatic and easily seen. They like these type types. They can take a mental snapshot of it. And then they help support deeper analysis. So one teacher summed up saying that, are they going to remember what went from where? No, but it's the big picture. There's not a simple explanation. They're talking about how it's useful to show the complexity, even if it doesn't clear it, clear it up, clear up the issue. It doesn't clear it up, but it visually shows how complex relationships could be. Again, transpose that quote into thinking about social studies, history and social science topics. And then if you compare that to the previous group where it's just trying to get bits of little discrete bits of information in the kids' heads as fast as possible. And so the striking visualizations um, that focus on, you know, the, the, they were interested in focus on attention and interest. How do you track that? How do you draw that? That was what was on these teachers' minds. And they were drawn to beautiful, complex visualizations to foster exploration and closer reading that they hoped would attract students' attention. They described them as drama drama dramatic, complex, rich, creative, catchy so that it draws the eye in, video game-ish. And if you don't get their attention, then you can't explain. And then so the three kind of major exemplars with that were the infographics, which was a very polarized view on that. People some liked it, some didn't. Um, the network graph below, and then the bottom, well, it's my right, is the flow chart. To kind of re recap this major theme of this group, they, they sought to capture, they sought to use visualizations for different purposes, to capture student interest, um, to explore the visualizations. They wanted students to explore to some extent. They weren't they didn't talk about using extensive time or even teaching them to read them, but they did think about them as more inquiry focused. And then um, visual complexity, they, they talked in different terms about it, not as an obstacle or a problem, but as a way that supports or gets students to think deeper about issues. And so I just have a few conclusions here and I'm wrapping up right on time. That's surprising. So um, we'll have time for questions. So a couple of things here, these are just kind of my final thoughts that, um, so I hope that this study, what I'm hoping with is that, you know, adds a visual dimension to research on learning to reason with online information, which I, like I said, is in my field has been something that's been, actually what they've done is they've used some visual information for this, but they've, they've treated it all the same. So other studies in my field have, that have looked at like online reasoning with information they use a graph or a cartoon or a picture or anything visual, they treat it the same as a written document. And there's very different ways of that people perceive things. And so I think that's problematic. So um, I think it's also well behind where the work has been done on written information. I hope it hopefully provides kind of in-depth explanations for teachers' choices and gets at a lot behind what 
uh, other research, which has been mostly survey research, doesn't get, which is a very, you know, gets a very broad view, but not very deep. And so hopefully this goes a bit deeper and gives a really kind of constructed view. And I think in the paper, I hope that it comes out even more kind of complicated and richer in terms of their explanations for their instructional thinking. And you, you know, you can start to even see from this information that, you know, you, you see teachers who are who are more who are thinking about visualizations in terms of more direct instruction or traditional lecturing, which again is that 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 thorny problem we have in social studies, and then other teachers who are starting to think about it, talk about it in using the language of inquiry. And then, you know, a, a bigger issue is that none of them really talked about them as texts in the way that scholars talk about them. Even the group that focused on beautiful visualizations and had used inquiry, some inquiry language, they didn't really talk about them as subjects of study. They talked about them as kind of secondary resources to add here or there, but they didn't talk about them. Um, they didn't talk about them as authored texts. And most of them focus more on reading level and student ability, which matters, obviously, and is a teacherly concern. But they also didn't think about this kind of notion of supportive struggle or more challenge um, and student interest. That was less apparent in the, in the interviews. And the last point is um, you know, this kind of preference for truth. It's obviously a concern in social studies because it's a continuing concern across different um, teaching strategies and courses. But the preference for truth you know, points to this bigger problem of instruction in social studies and the need for teachers. I think that's kind of the big argument is for the need for teachers to have better preparation, to think more critically about information sources, especially visual ones. And that's all I got for you today. I'll I stop sharing. Thank you, John. So we'll open it up to questions either in the chat or you can certainly unmute and um, ask Dr. Myers directly. Hi, is, um, may I go? I wanted to ask, is, have you seen any correlation between different types of teaching and different types of um, documents or graphs that uh, could help students, for example, the difference between graphs being shown to students in higher learning uh, in universities versus high schools, high schools versus middle schools, what is already working for elementary schools that maybe isn't being implemented, but is in their level uh, and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this study doesn't really get into what's going on in the classroom. So that's, you know, that's where it is. That's the kind of limitation with the study is that is it a strictly interview study. So I, I wouldn't say I, you know, again, it doesn't really get into what's going on. Um, the best we have with what's going on in the classroom, and of course, that's where I'd like to go next is kind of deeper into the classroom, some of this work and see, especially around student thinking and how students deal with and handle um, visualizations. Um, within the context of social studies. But yeah, at this point, most of what we know is survey related. And I wouldn't say we really know what you're asking. So it's a good question. Then I'm glad you're doing this research. <laughs> oh, thank you. John, do you mind if I ask a question? Of course. So, I mean, science teachers at the secondary level and middle school level struggle with this as well. Mm -hmm. um, and for many of the same reasons. So I, I understand that all our work is separate and History teachers have a lot of stuff to get through. So do chemistry teachers. So do you know earth-based science teachers. Sure. But in our quest to satisfy standardized tests, well, there's a couple of things going on. Um, we fail to teach kids essential skills. And if we look even at the standardized test, even in Florida, as wild as I am not about them, they they are pretty graphic dense. 
Mm -hmm. It's not just graphics kids have seen before, at least in science, it's graphics that kids have to reason their way through. Mm -hmm. um, could you envision doing something across curriculum? I mean, because graphs are graphs regardless of the discipline. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. Um, you know, maybe I'm not a broad enough thinker to handle some of that, but I've certainly seen some research that's, you know, some projects actually, that have done some of that. And I, I didn't mention that, but that's another part of the context is that um, especially the, you know, the EOC exams, especially the civics has graphs built in. They're fairly simple. And so I think that's one of the things that's interesting to me is like, so there's, I think there's two pieces. There's school graphs that you especially see in textbooks and um, state exams. And so some of the work there has been focused on decoding you know, decoding graphs and learning the visual elements and the conventions. And a lot of people in the field will argue that that's important, but it's the, I think it's same, it gets the same in, you know, probably people in reading or literacy could, you know, add a lot to that too, because there's also, it's also fairly limited. People will argue that that's ultimately not gonna be enough. Like for example, just to learn to check, to read sources, to check the source, you know, sourcing as we call it in social studies, for online information. Is that enough? If you get in the habit of checking sources, can you, is that enough to really not be duped online by information or that's running through social media? So it's part of it, what people would argue that it's also this bigger, um, this broader understanding of how information works and how mis misinformation works. And so a bigger picture of kind of data and information and how it's used. Um, but Maybe I'm going off on a tangent there, Sherry. I'm not sure. It's definitely, it may, would make a lot of sense to do it. I just think there's probably different purposes because with social studies, there's the school-based piece, which would connect very well. And then there's the current events piece, which I and some others would argue is maybe our biggest pressing need in social studies is dealing, having, helping students to deal with this flood of, you know, misinformation that, that washes through Facebook and other venues. Well, I know in science, we try to, you know, there's a big push to bring in current topics as anchors mm -hmm. for the, the canonical science that people need to learn. So I, I could see very nicely mm -hmm. where each unit could, you could spend some time unpacking a related graphic from every, everyday life that's related to the topic at hand. Um, kids tend to like that kind of work once you sort of devote your time to it. But um, yeah, no, something across disciplines, maybe that could get us out of this, this resentment we have about giving time over to anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then the, the EOC course, you know, those kind of courses um, also have, um, they also have even more challenging problems, you know, with the time, it's, it's even worse, the time issues and things. So, yeah, I mean, that would make a lot of sense. You want to work on that? And one, yes, let's do it. <laughs> and, and one last thing, and then I'll behave. Sorry, I've had too much coffee right. today. We need to do this because of the standardized tests, not despite them. For right. students to succeed and do well, we can't do this coverage stuff because it doesn't help them do well on the exams. So we have to teach them how to dig in and make sense of things that they may not already know, because yeah. that's what's required in most of the exams that we see. And with that, I'll hush. Yeah. I'll just say what Sherry said. That was good. Um, Denise asked if you have similar studies planned for students. And then we have one other question in the chat as well, John. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's what I'd really like to do. I'd hope to actually already be started on some of those, but obviously COVID things got get in the way, but um, yeah, I mean, that's what I'd really like to do. This is initially designed as kind of a, you know, kind of a, I wouldn't call it a baseline, but it's really an exploratory study to get started with this because there really hasn't, uh, again, it's not earth shattering or anything, but it's, there hasn't really been this kind of qualitative work uh, with teachers. Again, it's been more, much more survey related. There's been one or two other people who are doing some really interesting related things. But um, th I also am very interested in kind of the different purposes of visualizations, because one thing that really resonates with me in my field is that these are used, if you, if you follow these online, there are, these are used 
in some pretty incredible ways that relate to justice related issues. And so like, they're really incredible at uncovering things that are there, but we can't see. And so um, if that makes any sense. And so there's a lot, like for example, there's a site on um, a site on historical lynchings in the United States. So, you know, a pretty dark topic, but one that we take up in social studies. And so there's a lot of information on issues of uh, racial divisiveness and past um, kind of justice or human rights related issues that graphs are really powerful at revealing patterns that again are naked to the to the eye right and so some of those I think I would really I, that, that's one one area I think I would really like to work with on some topics that are already in the curriculum but these would be deeper like richer resources to explore and then what they do is and what I really like about a lot of these because I already do this with my teacher ed students and I have like a lot of examples that I, I was very proud that I didn't throw a hundred examples into the PowerPoint because I was really close to doing that. But um, some of the ones I use are, you know, they're really like visually powerful, but they show a lot of, again, uh, these, the big picture of some of these justice issues. Um, John, Elias asked, and please jump in, Elias, if I'm saying this incorrectly, but I believe he's asking if you're going to do any cross-referencing of responses before and or during after COVID to see if there's any anything there, or I believe that's what he's asking. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, no, I didn't think about, I didn't think about that. And so, right, this was, um, that would be, so following up is a, is a, that's a smart idea and would be interesting to do. I hadn't planned it, but I'll let you know if I can figure out how to do that. I did want to say specifically, yes, that was my question. And I'm happy you thought about that because one of my concerns mentally was just how has the process of online schooling at a national level and at a local level and all these different levels changed the way that teachers have been able to go about uh, document-based questions and graphs and stuff like that, especially because in my experience being 22 and having recently come out of the system, it was very different to what these kids are going through now. And it was very personal. And there was a lot of conversation and discussion going along. So that's why I wanted to know. That'd be great, yeah. John Shofeng asked if you could give a little more information on the teachers' backgrounds, if they were all high school teachers. And also, do you think their views of graphic information may vary as a result of, or as a function of the level of the class they teach or the type of school they teach, et cetera? Yeah, I um, I had a chart for that and I didn't show it, um, but they're all middle high school teachers. They were roughly evenly spread between middle and high school teachers and different types of schools. I didn't um, I didn't push too hard on my analysis. I really kind of want to um, I didn't push too hard on on some of that, like were there clear differences because I really wanted to concentrate and that's some of the direction I got from reviewers was to kind of focus on these two categories and push those deeper. But certainly like I was, you know, I think one area might be experience. So teachers experience, although not totally sure about that because like you said, there's this kind of inverse sometimes with us, like in some, like in other fields where new teachers might be more inquiry focused and or experienced teachers may not be, but it doesn't always work out that way. So, um, the, again, there are high school middle teachers. I will say one thing related to that question that was complicated is it was um, it was complicated in the design of the study is that so there is no there are social studies teachers most for the most part are not one subject teachers. Probably in other areas it's the same thing, but it's what's hard about this is visualizations of course are different in history than they are in government. Um, our teachers are all trained to teach any of the subjects, but that was one of the like design choices that I made that I thought was difficult. Do I choose ones on a particular content, you know, one content? Do I only try to find teachers on that particular content? Would that have shaped and influenced things? And ultimately that's kind of just, I think, a limitation of the study because there was no way humanly possible that I could figure out that you could focus it and keep it that clean just because teachers shift every year in terms of the classrooms that they teach and the um the classes that they teach and so they all they all teach a bit of everything for the most part even in middle school they tend to jump around so thanks Shofeng.
We still have about 15, 14 minutes if we have additional questions for Dr. Myers. Well, like I said, I ended a bit early so we don't go too long. If there is some time, I'd like to ask Mr. Myers or Professor Myers, I'd like to ask what, uh, are there any of your high school, middle school teachers uh, teaching English as a foreign language teachers? I don't think so. I, I wouldn't, I'm pretty certain they're not. I know many of them, but yeah, I'm pretty sure not. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You can also, if anyone has any questions or any comments or critique or want to work on learning visually in middle and high school, please, you can find my email, get in touch. Might you be able to put your email in the chat? Sure. Thank you. Rob is saying you have lots of potential collaboration opportunities with stats and math as well. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Rob. I oh, you saw that. Okay. Yeah, I saw. Okay. I finally got into the chat. Okay, good deal. So, John, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, you said none of the teachers were ESL teachers, but did they ever mention ESO students, ESO learners? Because in our field, we encourage K-12 teachers, content teachers to in to use graphic information to accommodate um, ESO learners or ancient language learners um, because of their limited proficiency and they can understand graphic information better than verbal information. Yeah, that's um, actually, I didn't even think of that connection. Um, and so that's actually really interesting, but they didn't really talk about that in the context of these interviews. They talked about their own teaching and what they do, mm. but they didn't talk so much about you know individual students or problems because again what they really concentrated on were the the mm. um, sets of graphs that I gave them that's especially what they talked about and knowing from the schools and things there there are English language learners of course but none of them were in a school that had a large number of them I don't think but that's actually a really interesting connection that I had not thought of because I'm really interested in you know this visual learning much more broadly. And it's been something I've done in my teaching for a long time, but not as much in research. Um, like for example, in history, I've worked for a long time on teaching using documentary photography to teach history as a way to kind of bring more empathy um, and understanding of events. John, I had a Quick question about your data collection and how you went about doing it. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. That that was a question. I thought you. Okay. Yeah, I was, you. Yes, that was my question. Is um, how did you do uh, the data collection? Uh, like just a time frame, just to get a sense of. Yeah, I mean, it was so it was twenty five interviews, and I could. You know that like that's that's the kind of thing there's no one number for how you for for deciding how much that works especially with this kind of study but you know i felt like that was going to cover the range of responses um and based on other studies too that kind of is a good you know estimate there but in terms of that 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 these were so these are interviews done you know they're not done during the school day they're done after school at a variety of schools it probably took about i don't know two to three months to collect for to do the interviews, um, some like I said, I, I, I kind of limited it to five schools, um, but yeah, I mean, it took a couple, it took about two to three months to collect the, to do the information, transcribe that. Is that what you're asking, just in terms of how long it took? Yes, and um, I was also uh, wondering, was there something that surprised you about the data itself? Something that surprised me about the data. Oh, I feel like I've looked at it so much and for so long. But I mean, probably the, um, like I didn't go in with those categories or those themes in mind. Like I know that's kind of a raging debate. I, I will tell you there are a lot of raging debates in the field of data visualization 
that I just find, I don't know, like kind of funny, some of them, because they take really small things. And this is a field that cuts across a huge number, a huge range of areas. It, you've got computer scientists who work on this. You've got um, data journalists, which is kind of a new area of journalism, data journalism. Um, you've got, of course, people in education who work on this. You've got a bunch of different fields who work around, you know, the impact of these. And so you get a lot of different views, but there, you know, there's like a raging debate within the field, which comes out better in the paper, uh, between this notion of um, like, there's a big push that graphs should be stripped down and every element should be meaningful and represent numbers and anything else is an embellishment and a distraction and it's terrible and it's a sin, you know? And then there's another side and people are very serious and heated about this. I'm just reading these and it's kind of interesting. And there's another side where you have designers like professional designers and artists who are, you know, if you search for, you know, data art, like you'll find a huge range of things going on, installations, but also work that's showing up in publications like the New York Times. And so I didn't really expect to find that exact, I mean, I, I certainly wasn't, you know, expecting to find that, but it was, a, it was a debate that really I knew about and it really came out strongly in the data. So I guess that was, you know, I would be one surprise. Thank you. Oh, last thing I'll just mention, another one of those raging debates, if you're ever interested in, is the pie chart is a huge source of tension within the field of data visualization. And I kid you not, it is, it is people argue over these types, types of things. And so I, I referenced it briefly in the paper, but it is this, like this, it's this huge debate over, you know, which graphs are best and which ones should be used and which ones are not. And the pie chart is seen as a little bit infantile and too overly simplistic and not precise enough. <laughs> Rob is team anti-fire chart, right? I get it, Rob. And so it really is like that. There's a, it's a huge, it's like Apple um, Windows, you know, like it's the same thing for pie charts. And so you get in these raging debates over these things. And then, and then of course, when you look at them in schools, what's interesting to me at least is that you've got these academic debates. And then of course, you've got what, what really works and what people use and matter. And of course, people love pie charts. They're, they're also like really badly done in lots and lots of examples where you have like a pie chart is part of a whole and you've got a, so it should be 100% and the percent adds up to 115 or something. You have these kinds of wild examples. But anyways, it's, it's, it was really interesting to kind of compare how this played out in real people's lives who deal with these in a very serious way with some of these raging academic debates. And I'm glad to hear Rob is part of that. Any last minute questions for well, last five minute questions for Dr. Myers. I think we had a good number of questions. We did. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again, Dr. Myers for your time this afternoon. And please um, everyone mark your calendar for December 3rd. It's a quick turnaround with the holiday week next week, but Dr. Jennifer Perry from our visual disabilities program will be joining us for our last um, talk of the 2021 year. So um, please be on the lookout for um, links coming through social media and listservs and all that good stuff. So we appreciate everyone's time and please enjoy yourselves next week or so. Thanks everyone. appreciate your time. <laughs>